All right. Welcome uh, to the Evergreen Streamlined Person-Centered Plan and Prior Authorization Webinar. For those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Leslie Miska, and I joined the Office of Aging and Disability Services back in February of 2016 as the Information Services Manager. My primary role within ODES is oversight and management of our electronic data systems, and that includes currently EIS and futuristically the Evergreen Data System. Joining me on today's presentation is Walter Goodlett. He's the Evergreen Project Organizational Change Management and Communications Subject Matter Expert, as well as Nancy Kitchen, who's one of our ODES Data and Compliance Specialists and who has been an integral Evergreen Project participant, including requirements and testing. Next slide, please, Nikki. Over the next hour, I plan to share a little project background, the streamlined PCP and PA process, some next steps, details for how you can stay engaged and get some additional support, and then we'll wrap up by answering as many questions as we can live on today's webinar. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Participants have been added to the meeting in listener mode, therefore your line is muted. However, we do wanna be able to get your questions and answer those at the end of the webinar. So throughout the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A icon that's located in your Zoom window menu. And you can type your questions at any time. And once we get to the end, I will answer as many of them as I can in the time that remains. And any questions that we don't have time to get to, we will certainly add to our frequently asked questions that we will be posting on our website soon. Next slide, please, Nikki. The purpose of the Evergreen Data System Project is to implement a single electronic data system that will replace the office's three major legacy data systems, which includes EIS, MAPSIS, and MeCare. The project is being completed in a phased approach. This is the first phase, which included three production releases. The first release was in May of 2019, and it was a very small pilot release with just a couple of internal ODE staff users, and it was to manage our developmental disabilities um, wait lists. And then in May of, uh, sorry, in June of 2020, we had our second production release, and that was for our adult protective services and guardianship conservatorship, public guardianship conservatorship programs. And our third and upcoming release is scheduled for January 16th, 2024, and that will be for our developmental disabilities and neurobehavioral programs. The primary goal of the project is to enhance the quality of services for our constituents. And some of the benefits that we will recognize from doing so include automating some of our current paper and manual processes, reducing the amount of redundant data entry, streamlining some of our workflows and business processes, and improving data and reporting. Next slide, please, Nikki. Please note that during today's webinar, I will be providing a high level overview of some of the portions of the developmental disabilities person-centered planning process and will not be showing every screen or field within the forms, nor will I be able to point out every field or feature on each of the slides that you see today. That said, there will be plenty of time for you to explore the system between now and January. Also, access to the Evergreen person records and forms is role-based, so depending on your role, you may or may not have access to everything that you see during this webinar. Like other Evergreen forms, the person-centered plan can be found by navigating to the person record and then clicking on the forms and plans icon in the primary navigation on the left-hand menu, the green navigation bar. I've circled that icon in red in this screenshot and the background of it appears to be white because I was clicked into that um, forms list page when I took this screenshot. If your role includes the ability to create person-centered plans, you will be able to use the plus add new form button from the forms and plans um, list page and then select the person-centered plan option under case care plans and forms category. Once you've done that, you will select the waiver program. In this example, I've chosen main care, section, main care section 29, and you'll select the PCP type of initial. When you uh, create a PCP from the forms list page, you will always be creating an initial type. The, the um, PCP does have the ability to, to revise, 
that would be done from a previous completed version of the PCP. And when you revise, you can do a type of annual or a change type PCP. And there are several different um, change reasons for your PCP. Um, in this case, when I chose main care section 29 and the type of initial, the system alerted me that my person, which is Leslie Test, did not have a completed comprehensive assessment and that completing the assessment first would save the redundant data entry. It, and it asks me if I am sure I want to continue. If you don't want to capture the data twice, you can simply click cancel here and be navigated back to the all forms list page where you can choose the plus add new form button to create a comprehensive assessment form first. This form is located under the assessments category. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon creation of the comprehensive assessment, the system will navigate you into the form. The comprehensive assessment is a new form in Evergreen, which will become part of the developmental disabilities person-centered planning process. The comprehensive assessment will replace the BMS 99, psychosocial, and portions of the V7. The other portions of the V7 will be found in the PCP. Just like other complex evergreen forms, you will be defaulted to view mode when you are navigated into the comprehensive assessment and all sections will be collapsed. You can use the toggle icon in the upper right-hand side of the screen to open your quick scroll menu, which will reveal the sections of this form, which include overview, assessment information, health and wellness, home and housing, safety and security, community engagement, employment, social and relationships, lifelong learning, communication and advocacy, summary and skills and abilities definitions. You can scroll to view each section or you can click on the section that you'd like to be automatically navigated to from your quick scroll menu. To populate the form, you will need to click on the edit toggle in the upper left-hand corner of the content area. Prior to starting, you can click on the print icon to run the exploration and discovery report, which was covered during the reportable events and progress note webinar um, in early November. And you can get those recordings if you were unable to um, participate in that webinar series, you can get those recordings from our project website. And then once you've completed the form, you can use the BMS 99 comprehensive assessment um, print uh, to view just those questions and answers. Next slide, please, Nikki. Once in edit mode, which you can see that I'm in edit mode, um, I've circled the little um, edit mode icon in the upper left-hand corner of the content area, and you can tell that I'm in edit mode because my little toggle button is orange now. Once in edit mode, you can use the quick scroll menu on the right or um, your page arrows to move to the sections, subsections you want to populate. As it highlighted in the quick scroll menu, each of the eight top level domains, uh, domain based sections of the comprehensive assessment follow the same structure. The first subsection within each domain will display any history items that have been captured for that person under that top level domain. Then, depending on the domain, there will be two or three subsections or subdomains. Each domain will display relevant content from the person record, followed by custom assessment questions for that topic area. The last subsection under each top level domain is the standard need assessment for that domain. The need assessment, as shown in the central content area of this slide, is a standard set of questions, including whether there is a need identified for that domain, and if yes, a required description, as well as a multi-add list, which allows you to enter as many individual needs as the person has related to this top level domain. Each need that is added will display in a table format as shown at the bottom of the content area of this screenshot. In this example, I indicated that there was a need of free and reliable transportation to get to and from the gym Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. 
I then added the need of transportation with a description of Monday, Wednesday, Friday to and from the gym. Next slide, please, Nikki. Underneath the need questions and that multi-add list for the need, there are two more multi-add lists for capturing as many individual strengths and barriers that the person possesses in relation to this top level domain. Prior to adding any records, the system will display a message like the one that you see here in indicating that there are no strength records or barrier records available and a button, a, a green plus add strength or a green plus add barrier button that you can be used to add strengths and barriers. Next slide, please, Nikki. In this example, I added a strength of motivated with a description of Leslie enjoys working out and is motivated to go to the gym regularly, which displays in the same table format as the need did. Please note that all of the data captured in the comprehensive assessment will be viewable from within the person-centered plan and any needs, strengths, and barriers captured will flow into the person-centered plan so that the case manager does not have to recapture that data. Next slide, please, Nikki. Once the comprehensive assessment has been completed, you can then create your PCP. In this example, I have selected the program of main care section 29 and the type of initial, and the system has defaulted the plan effective date range for me by setting the effective start date to today's date and the end date to the same month, day, plus one year. However, these dates are editable, so you can set these dates appropriately if you're creating your initial PCP um, on a different day than your effective plan start date. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon saving the system, upon saving, the system will navigate you into the PCP tab of the PCP form. Just like the comprehensive assessment, you will be in view mode. So you can see that I've circled the little edit mode toggle in the upper left and it's gray because I'm in view mode right now. You can use the toggle icon in the upper right hand corner of the content area to open the quick scroll menu, revealing the sections of the PCP, which are overview, personal profile, exploration and discovery, my meeting, my circle of support, my life planning, rights, supports, and modifications, summary of meeting, summary of plan. Please note that the Evergreen PCP matches the EIS PCP form. The only significant differences are that the Evergreen PCP is more dynamic. For example, the Evergreen PCP has the ability to display content from the comprehensive assessment and the person record and is more automated than the EIS version. For example, it will auto-generate service implementation plans, home and community-based settings rights modification addendums, and prior authorizations, and trigger notifications to the different system users, letting them know when those forms are ready to be populated or reviewed. Both the PCP and comprehensive assessment also have the add information button, which I've circled, in the middle, top middle of this screenshot. This allows the case manager or care coordinator to be able to add history, person contacts, or attachments directly from within this respective form rather than having to navigate away and capture those items at the person record level. Next slide, please, Nikki. The PCP has four workflow statuses, which include pending planning team meeting. This is the status that the PCP is in until the team meeting has occurred, pending state review, pending provider selection, and plan completed. In the edit mode, you are able to see the subsections of the quick scroll menu as well. In this example, I've circled the exploration and discovery section, which has subsections of exploration and discovery person-centered thinking tools, getting the life I want, and other agenda items. In the central content area, you can see that I am in the getting the life I want section under the health and wellness domain. If you click on the health and wellness header, an accordion will expand to display the health and wellness section of the most recently completed comprehensive assessment so that you don't have to keep navigating away from the plan to see what was captured during the assessment. Just like the person history, progress note exploration and discovery, and the comprehensive assessment, 
the PCP getting the life I want is also domain based. Each domain has the same set of questions, one text field and four multi-add lists. These questions will create the goals under the My Life Planning section of the PCP, as well as the available selections under the Risks Dual list in the My Life Planning section. These questions are what's important to for me, which is a text box, what I want to stay the same, maintain, which is a multi-add list, what I want to be different, add, change, stop, which is also a multi-add list, and two multi-add lists for these are the risks with what I want to stay the same, and these are the risks with what I want to be different. In this example, I indicated that going to the gym was important to for me, and what I wanted to stay the same was going to the gym Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. To continue populating the plan, you can use the page navigation buttons that you see at the bottom of this screenshot. Please note that you should be sure to use the save button to commit content before moving away from your computer. And you should use the save and next button to commit content to the database and keep going within the um, plan. And the page arrows should only be used when you have not added any content and simply want to move forward or backward to a different page. Next slide, please, Nikki. In the essence of time for today's webinar, I will skip down to the My Life Planning section of the Person-Centered Plan to show you how my getting the life I want, health and wellness, what I want to stay the same record has been auto-populated as my first goal name. The My Life Planning section of the PCP includes the subsections of My Life Planning Person-Centered Thinking Tools, My Goals, My Goal Review, My Needs, My Strengths, My Barriers, Services and Supports, Change and Waiver Services, State Review, and Medication Review Dates. In order to populate the rest of the fields under My Goals, it is recommended that the planning team review all of the goal titles and then jump down to populate the services and supports first, and then work your way back up to the goals. This way, all of your pick lists and dual lists in the goals um, card will be populated with services, supports, barriers, strengths, and needs before you need before linking each of those items to the individual goal. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon clicking on the services and supports in the quick scroll menu, you will be navigated to that page where the green multi-add list button with the label plus add service or support will appear, which you can see sort of grayed out to the left of the screenshot that I've circled. Once clicked on, the system will present a pop-up modal as seen in the center of the screenshot. The first field in that modal is a pick list of services and supports types. This includes case management, community natural resources, non-waiver service, waiver service, and proposed waiver service, which should only be used when applying for a new waiver. Next slide, please, Nikki. In this example, I selected waiver service and then clicked on the search icon to find the service I wanted to link to this PCP. As you can see, there's a quick keyword search or an advanced search option. Since I knew the procedure code of the service I was looking for, I typed T2021 into the quick search. However, you can also search based on the service title or description if you don't know what the procedure code is. The system will return all of the services matching your criteria and the program of this PCP. So in this example, I'm in a section 29 PCP and I've typed T2021. So the system has returned me the corresponding services that have that meet those criteria. Each service will be delineated by a line above and below it. In this example, I've circled the first service in my results, which was community membership, community only group 29. However, you can see multiple options were returned with the procedure code of T2021 in it, and that's because they have different modifiers. To select the service, you will click the plus link icon, which I've circled in the middle of this screenshot. Next slide, please, Nikki. 
Upon linking the service, you'll be navigated back to the Add Service or Support modal, where your waiver service is now displaying the service you linked under the service name, which is the second circle and down into the right that I've circled there. You can see it's it's kind of cut off, but it says um, community membership, community only, individual 29, which is T2021 UA, which is what I linked when I created the screenshot. The system is displaying my rate unit and rate type for this service, which is a 15 minute unit. And it defaulted my service effective date range to match my PCP dates. However, these fields are also editable. It then presented my options for the frequency of this service. And in this case, it's a six month frequency because the units of this service will be broken into two six month PAs. Um, and it allowed me to populate the hours per week, which in this example, I selected 10. Um, and th these are the hours that are being requested by the person and their planning team. As well as um, the description of scope fields, whether any portion of the service is being offered in a non-disability setting, and a text field to describe when the person will no longer need or want supports. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon saving, the service will be displayed as seen here. Please note that the provider field has been intentionally left blank. This is because the plan requires the state review before completing the provider selection. And I'll come back to that uh, in a little bit further in the webinar. Next slide, please, Nikki. After entering all of the services and supports, it's recommended that you review and edit the My Barriers and My Strengths sections. These sections look identical. And in the screenshot, you can see that the strength of motivated and good with finances have migrated in from my comprehensive assessment that I completed before I started this plan. The case manager also has the ability to add more strengths and or barriers right directly from within the PCP if that's needed. You would do that by scrolling to the bottom of the page that you're on. In this case, we're on my strengths. We would scroll to the bottom and there would be a plus add strengths button that we can use to add additional strengths right here in the PCP. Next slide, please, Nikki. After reviewing the strengths and barriers, we recommend doing the same with the my needs. Any needs captured in the comprehensive assessment will migrate in with a status of unmet. You can see um, kind of grayed out in the middle of this um, left-hand side of this screenshot. I've circled the status, which um, defaulted to unmet. The case manager, however, should edit each need and populate the remaining fields that are required within the need, as well as uh, which include in, an indication of whether this resource, this is a resource need, yes or no, and updating the status to reflect whether the services supports added below will meet this need or not. Next slide, please, Nikki. Once all of those sections have been reviewed and completed, the case manager can then circle back to complete the remaining goal fields. In this example, I've selected the goal of visiting the gym, mon visiting the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I entered the desired outcome and I can see that the system has auto populated the domain of health and wellness as that was the domain which the goal originated from. However, the case manager does have the ability to edit this if needed. Next slide, please, Nikki. The case manager then has the ability to select the corresponding strengths, barriers, risks, needs, and services and supports associated with each goal. Please note that if you attempt to populate the goal fields before completing the other subsections of the My Life Planning, your dual lists may not include all the selections you require. Next slide, please, Nikki. Once the planning team has completed all the sections required for the state review, the case manager will set the plan to a status of pending state review. The system will then trigger a notification to the resource coordinator, letting them know that there is a PCP, in this case for Leslie's, Leslie Test, which requires state review. The logged in resource coordinator, in this example in the upper right hand corner, Sandra resource coordinator, can simply click on the notification icon to see this list of results 
and then select the appropriate person-centered plan by clicking on the desired row and being navigated directly into that person-centered plan for review. Next slide, please, Nikki. After reviewing the plan contents, the resource coordinator will populate the state review fields, which you can see in the background of this, in the central content area, kind of behind my status dropdown in this um, screenshot. These are the state review fields and they will complete those and then set the status from pending state review to submit for provider selection. Next slide, please, Nikki. The change in plan status will then trigger another notification to the assigned case manager. In this example, Jesse CCM, who I've circled in the upper right hand corner, to let that person know that the state review has been completed and the plan is now ready for provider selection. The case manager can then click on the notification to be navigated directly back into the PCP to complete this part of the process. Next slide, please, Nikki. Please note that the current vendor call process should still be used to identify providers if the person does not know which providers they would like to invite to submit service implementation plans. Once the providers are known, the case manager should navigate back into each waiver service and invite the provider or providers to submit service implementation plans using the multi-add button under the service implementation plan provider invitations at the bottom of each waiver service. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon clicking the plus add button, you will be presented with a provider search field, which you can see at the bottom, it's sort of grayed out in the background that I circled there. When you click search, you will have the option, you'll get this other pop-up modal that's on the front here in the center, that will give you the option to do a keyword search, a quick keyword search, or use the advanced search to narrow your results and find the provider that you would like to invite. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon selecting the provider and saving, the system will, will create the service implementation plan and create a notification that will be sent to that provider, letting them know that they've been invited to submit a service implementation plan. At this time, the waiver provider will not have um, an assignment to the person record and will not be able to access the person record. So they will need to access the service implementation plan form under their location forms list and populate it there. The case manager, uh, the system, however, will also add this SIP to the SIP tab of this PCP. So you can see I've circled the SIP tab because that's what I was on when I took this screenshot. And you can see here in this example, I've invited a single provider to submit a SIP for this single service. However, if I'd invited another provider to submit a SIP for this service or this provider to submit a SIP for another service, there would be multiple rows on this SIP tab, one for each provider and service combination. In this example, I invited CCM Works, which is the provider location, to submit a SIP for community membership, community only individual 29 service. I did that on November 8th, and the SIP is in an in-progress status because the provider has not yet completed it for review. Once uh, next, next slide, please, Nikki. As the case manager, I can click open the SIP from that SIP tab. As you can see from the screenshot, the SIP has a similar structure and navigation as the PCP, and the user can click the toggle icon in the upper right-hand corner to see all the sections of the SIP, which happen to be SIP template, goal and service details, which are displayed from within the PCP tab, and what and are the details required for the waiver provider to populate the final and third section, which is the service implementation plan SIP details. This is the section of the plan that will be filled out by the provider. Once the provider has populated the SIP with the details, the plan details, they will submit the SIP for review, which will trigger a notification to the assigned case manager who will then review and approve the submitted SIPs with the person. 
please note that I am not going to review all of the particular fields within the SIP today. However, providers, waiver providers will have the opportunity to participate in SIP training in December. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon approval, the case manager will then navigate to each waiver service in the PCP and populate that empty provider field, the one that we intentionally left blank prior to the state review with the selected provider for that waiver service and then save. After all, next slide, please, Nikki. After all the waiver services have been updated to reflect the selected providers, the case manager will complete the remaining required fields, including the SIP survey and capture the signatures. And then their completion requirements will look like the one that you're seeing to the right center here with the green check marks. Then they'll use the status dropdown, which I've also circled here, to set the plan to complete. This will trigger the system to auto assign the selected providers so they will now have access to the person record and can navigate to the person forms and plans and see the list of PCPs for that person and navigate in, but only to see content on the SIP list tab, uh, SIP tab of the person-centered plan. The waiver provider will see a message on the PCP tab indicating that they do not have access to the PCP itself, just the SIP tab. And on the SIP tab, they will only have access to their own SIPs. It will, the system will also, at the time of completing the plan, create the prior authorizations and trigger a notification to the resource coordinators that the prior authorizations are ready for their review and authorization. Next slide, please, Nikki. In Evergreen, the prior authorizations are considered a form and can be located by navigating to the All Forms list page under the Forms and Plans icon in the person record. So I've circled that again for you on the left navigation, Forms and Plans, and you can see that I'm in the All Forms list page up at the top central content area. And in this screenshot, you can see a new prior authorization record at the top of the forms list page with some generic details, including the form ID, the program for which this prior authorization was created, the create date, and the created by and a few other fields of data. Next slide, please, Nikki. By using the filter icon in the upper right-hand corner of this um, content area, that upside down pyramid hamburger icon, you can navigate to the custom prior authorization list page, which includes some more granular details, such as the PA number, the provider's name, the provider's NPI plus three, the service name, the procedure code and modifiers, and the start and end dates for that prior authorization. You can open the prior authorization form from either list page by clicking on the specific row that you'd like to navigate into. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon system creation, the prior authorization form will be in a status of in progress with the source of the person-centered plan. So you can see I've circled in the cent center there that the source shows as person-centered plan. Please note that the resource coordinators and care monitors will have the ability to also create PAs directly from within the all forms or custom PA list page if that is necessary. However, PAs should generally be created off of a completed PCP. The sections of the PA form include the overview and provider information and the original request, which will all be populated um, by the system if generated off the PCP. And the fourth section, which is the service information section, which will be reviewed and completed by the resource coordinator or care monitor. Next slide, please, Nikki. Upon selecting a service line from the service information section, the resource coordinator or care monitor will be navigated to the service details page. This will be in a status of pending review. The requested service details will be displayed from within the PCP in the left-hand column, which I've circled here in red. The resource coordinator care monitor will use the right arrow or caret in the center of the screen to copy those details forward into the right-hand side of the screen, which is the authorized service fields. 
Once copied, the resource coordinator or care monitor has the ability to make any necessary edits before completing the decision information portion of this section of the prior authorization form. Please note that I am not going to review the remaining sections or fields within the prior authorization form. However, resource coordinators and care monitors will have an opportunity to participate in prior authorization training in December. Next slide, please, Nikki. So what's next? Please continue to read our email communications, which will be sent out after this webinar series, as well as some communications in um, December and January, reminding you of training and the de upcoming deployment. Please continue to work on cleaning up your EIS data to ensure the most successful migration possible. You can find the details about the steps to do so in our September 25th, 2023 email that was a subject line of update on Evergreen Release 3 rollout, and which has also been posted to our Evergreen Project website. And um, this month, you'll be able to register for your role-based training topic or topics, depending on your role. And those registration links should be posted this week, maybe even today. They may even be out there already. I didn't get a chance to go check before this webinar, um, but most certainly before the week's end. And we will definitely uh, send an email out once those are live. Next slide, please, Nikki. So in order to stay engaged and get additional support, please continue to leverage the volunteer network of change champions. These individuals are helping us transition, helping with the transition to Evergreen by working at the grassroots level. You can find out more information about them at our website, and, as well as a list of who the change champions are. All of our project communications are being sent by email, so please make sure that your email address is correct in the EIS system, and if not, please notify our EIS user accounts team at eissupport.dhhs.mean.gov. If you have any questions or any feedback or anything at all that you'd like to share, please reach out to us at our project email at evergreen.dhhs.mean.gov. For links to all of our project communications, recorded webinars, and frequently asked questions, please visit our Evergreen Project website at maine.gov slash DHHS slash EIS slash Evergreen. Next slide, please, Nikki. We've made it to the question and answer portion of today's webinar, and it looks like we do have a few questions in our Q&A um, icon already. If you have any questions, please go ahead and start entering them in the Q&A icon. And um, if, if time permits, I will answer those live today. And if not, we will certainly uh, respond to those as part of our frequently asked questions that will be posted to our project website soon. Heidi asks, the BMS 99 Compass is for 21. Is this for 29 as well? Example, BMS 99 support assessment. Uh, I think your um, question, Heidi, is will the BMS 99 questions be asked in the comprehensive assessment for both section 21 and 29? And the answer is uh, yes. The BMS 99 questions are present in both the section 21 and section 29 comprehensive assessment form in Evergreen. Bonnie asks, to add information, do you have to be in edit mode? Yes, Bonnie, I think your question is uh, regarding adding, um, well, I'm not sure. If your question is um, regarding adding information at the history, person contacts, or attachments, no, you do not have to be in edit mode. You can, you can always add um, information from either mode, edit or view. Um, if it was... Your question Oh, well, it was in regards to the little, the when you're on the screen, it has add information and it talks yes. about, has a little thing for assessment and comment, or I can't remember what yeah. the three yeah. drop down yes. things are. Yeah. So in that case, Bonnie, you can be in view or edit. You don't have to be um, in edit. Um, you can be in either one. And that will allow you to add history to the person record. It will allow you to add person contacts to the person record. And it will add, allow you to add, add attachments to the form that you're in. But if you need to add content to the PCP form itself or the comprehensive assessment form itself, you will need to be in edit mode in order for those fields to become editable for you. 
Bonnie also asks the effective date range is calculating one year, but should be one year minus one day. Um, it was my understanding during requirements, Bonnie, that was supposed to be the same day and month and the year was just incremented. So that's the way that we had it default, but that end date can be editable to uh, subtract the one day if the plan year is supposed to be a true 365 day calendar year. Um, Leslie asks, is the state review a new process? Um, that's a great question, Leslie. I was under the impression that the state review was already occurring in EIS, but I'm not positive on that. So we'll certainly take that back and be able to um, give a more definitive answer um, in our frequently asked questions. But if it's not already part of the developmental disabilities person-centered planning process, it will be part of the process in Evergreen. So after the planning team meeting and prior to provider selection, the resource coordinator team will review the person-centered plan to ensure that the plan um, supports the waiver services and units uh, being requested for those waiver services. Bonnie asks, how do you submit to the RC? Good question, Bonnie. So like after the team meeting, when you're ready for the resource coordinator to um, do the state review, you'll use the status dropdown as the case manager or care coordinator, you'll use that status dropdown to set the plan into pending or submit for state review and then it will change the plan workflow status to um, pending state review and it will automatically trigger that notification to the resource coordinator that they need to do that review okay Once so the there's no there's no submit button or anything because there's some other there's other parts where it has to go like when the resource coordinator sends it back to the case manager and stuff so it's just changing a status automatically generates that that notification correct yep okay. so it's the workflow status um, clicking on that new status is what um, triggers the notification and it changes the form workflow status to indicate that that's been triggered okay thank you because I know we yeah. weren't necessarily seeing the full pages so I didn't know you're if there was right down on the yeah. bottom yeah, you're right. No, I didn't I didn't show that one explicitly. So it will look similar to the screenshot that I showed where after the state review occurred and the resource coordinator clicked on that status um, button at the top and it drops down the little little list and theirs had submit for provider selection. It will be very similar to that. Instead, it will say submit for state review. Donna, asked, uh, Donna says the state review is happening by waiver specialists for waiver applications and then by resource coordinators when there are proposed services. It's not happening for PCPs if it is not for an application or um, to propose services currently for the add, change, and end. So it seems the state review process is happening sometimes, um, but not, not for every um, PCP. Thank you, Donna. Are there other questions? We do still have about 15 minutes left. I'm happy to answer additional questions. Um, also, Nikki was uh, kind enough to enter into the meeting chat for you our the link to our project website, where you'll be able to find all of our frequently asked questions once those get posted uh, very soon. And she's also put the EIS support uh, .dhhs at main.gov email address and our project email address of evergreen.dhhs at main.gov. And even if there are uh, no additional questions today and you think of something later, you can always email those to evergreen.dhhs at main.gov. Nancy Kitchen is now monitoring that email box for us so that we can try to give more timely responses to questions there. And questions that come in will be added to our frequently asked questions list, even though they weren't asked on these webinar series. Leslie, when's the next yeah. set of webinars? What and what's the the subject Great. matter? 
Great question, Bonnie. So this is the last series of informational webinars. So we did a series in mid-October that was around the person record and some of the benefits of the person record. We did a series in early November that was around the reportable event form and the person uh, and the progress notes. And then we're doing this series this week. So um, around this PCP and PA streamlined process. There's uh, one more session of this tomorrow at four o'clock and then two sessions on Wednesday, one at 8 a.m. and noon. So any of your colleagues that haven't been able to participate in this one can certainly sign up for those. And then after this series, we won't be doing any more um, informational webinars. We'll be um, transitioning into tra actual training. So training registration links will be posted out on our project website this week. Um, and the training registrations will be role-based. So you'll wanna read the titles and the uh, of that training. And then there should be a little description indicating which roles should participate in which training topics. And that's where you'll get a little bit um, deeper dive into some of these forms and a more well-rounded um, training for yourself and your specific role. Um, and then those will go all the way from uh, early December right up until there are some sessions even the week before um, planned sessions the week before our deploy. The, the ones that are closer to the deploy will be more business process related um, topics. So even deeper dives into some of the forms that you've already been trained on, or they'll be for um, very specific, um, smaller um, audiences, like some internal staff or a very specific um, form or module, potentially like the reportable event form and how to populate that. Are there any other questions for today? I don't see any more in the q and I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has them, but we can certainly adjourn early. I know it's the end of the day. And if you're like me, you guys have been working hard all day and, and tired and ready for some dinner. <laughs> Awesome. I'm not seeing any more questions in the q and I want to thank all of you for your participation at the end of the day today and uh, for the great questions and definitely let your colleagues know that we have a few more sessions scheduled for this webinar and we'd love to share with them as well and keep your eyes open for our email about registration links and get registered once they're there.